be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. There is a certain kind of weight to preaching on Easter Sunday like no other Sunday over the year. Every Sunday we call a mini Easter. It's a day that we remember and celebrate the resurrection. But on Easter Sunday it is unique, it is different because this is it. This is our hope. It is Resurrection Sunday. We prepared it to be following the Lenten calendar for 40 days, preparing for this. And the world waits its entire life to hear this message that death does not have the final answer. In our on-demand world, where you get what you want, when you want, how much you want, Lent tells us to be still. It tells us to slow down. It tells us to wait. Something better is coming. Lent tells us that, but Easter shows us. Easter reveals to us that thing for which we have been waiting, individually and collectively. Even if we do not fully understand what it is. This is the, the great challenge of preaching on Easter because we talk about, we proclaim resurrection, but even the first Easter, they did not understand what they were experiencing. They did not understand the magnitude of what is going on, and I wonder sometimes if we grasp it. Today's passage comes after a couple of heartbreaking chapters, a couple of heartbreaking days in Luke's gospel where the narrative moves from the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem to his trip to the temple and the last meal of the disciples and, and then the betrayal and his arrest and conviction and crucifixion and his death and then they put him into a tomb. They roll the stone over the tomb and then the gospels are silent. It says they wait that Holy Saturday. They wait and everything is quiet and we are left to wonder if death wins. Hearts are heavy. God seems silent. And so we come to the text today thinking what is next? Asking that question. In our household, bedtime is the best time. And for younger parents, young, I don't call myself a young parent anymore, but young-ish parents, you know that feeling of of getting the kids to bed. I would say my most terrifying moment of the week are the children's messages. <laughs> so I, I look forward to that so much that I don't know what Sam's going to say. And we do why, and that's what's terrifying. But at bedtime, when it goes smoothly, it's wonderful. And, and Samuel is the only one of our three who lets us read to him on a consistent basis. And when we go to this wide collection of books that he has, he has a few stories in what he loves to say. You've heard it this morning, and I know that. I know that one. Whatever we do, I know how to do it. I, I've read that one. I know the story. We decided perhaps for a And we come to the text, although Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all different in the way to describe the resurrection, we are tempted to come to the story and say, I know that. I've heard it before. I, I know the characters. I know the scene. But what the resurrection invites us to do is to hear it with resurrected ears, to see the story with resurrected eyes, and to experience the story. So may you know the story, but more than that, may it know you. Our scripture passage is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners 
and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven, and all of it to the rest. Now was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter, Peter got up and he ran to the tomb. He stooped and he looked in and he saw the living clothes by themselves. But he did not see the body. And then he went home amazed at what had happened. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Luke chapter 24 is unique. You think of all the Gospels. I've not checked the whole Bible, but here as I can figure, it is the one chapter that begins with the word but. These three letters that mean so much after the crucifixion, the death, the burial of Jesus. We have these three wonderful letters. After Holy Saturday, it starts off, but the story is not it is not a period, it is a comma at the end of the 23rd chapter of Luke. And on the first day of the week, as the skies are starting to change from dark to light, you imagine the world beginning to turn red in the dawn. The women set off, their eyes are heavy with, with sleep and grief. They bring the spices for the dead. And when they come to the place, the place they go, that Jesus was laid, the dead body of stone was placed over the tomb. As they come there, something is amiss. The stone is rolled away, the tomb is open, and then looking in, the tomb is empty. And they are perplexed. What is going on? Before they even get a chance to, to really ask, that question among themselves. There are two angelic visitors who show up. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite scenes in one of my favorite movies, Forrest Gump. And, and you might remember this scene where Lieutenant Dan, after he had been crippled, he was going through a, a difficult period, talking to Forrest Gump in this small hovel of an apartment in New York City. And he asked Forrest this question, have you found Jesus yet? He said, that's all the people down in the Veterans Administration, the, the VA hospital, that's all they're talking about. Have you found Jesus yet? And do you remember what God replies? I didn't know we were supposed to be looking for him, sir. But this is the thing in this whole gospel narrative, this whole beginning, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, you do not hear his name mentioned once. Jesus had been there from the beginning with the disciples. Jesus had been there from the beginning in Luke's Gospel, but we don't even hear his name. He is alluded to, and so we ask that same question. Where is Jesus? Where have they taken him? Where is he? He is not here in the tomb. The two mysterious men ask them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Don't you remember we told you? This has been a hard week with deaths in our church and deaths in the community. And there are times where death seems to hold on to us, seems to cover us in the world like a wet army blanket, cold and heavy, difficult to get out of that grief. And remember, reminded of the story that Barbara Brown Taylor once told. She was leading a worship service at a nursing home and she asked the residents, what story from the Bible do you want to hear? And they were quiet for a while. Not to say anything for a while. But then, tell us a story about resurrection. The best stories are resurrection stories. The best stories are those that remind us that death and sin and evil and darkness do not have the final say. That while they might seem to be powerful, we have a divine cut in the text that says, but God is doing something new. The world needs to hear about resurrection, about reconciliation, about 
restoration about why that springs forth even after death. We need to hear about that here in Joplin in our neighborhood. They need to hear that in Brussels, Belgium. They need to hear that in Zandaria, Iraq, Mali, Mexico, all these places. They need to hear that not just people who are inside these walls, not people uh, outside these walls, but everyone needs to hear the message that the tomb is empty, that God is alive. In the face of death, we will leave an empty tombs. We might be tempted to say, I know this one. I heard this one. But do you believe this one? Have you experienced this one? Each gospel account is a little different regarding the resurrection, but each time I read them, if I'm honest, it's a little bit like looking at a Jackson Pollock painting. You know, Jackson Pollock, all that paint slattering it. And I know it's a work of art, I know it's beautiful, but I'd be lying if I said I fully understood it. It would be lying if we said we fully understood resurrection when we see so much death. But the women don't understand it, but then they remember what Jesus had taught them. And the women do something amazing. They return from the tomb, they go and tell the eleven remaining disciples, they tell everyone that Jesus is alive, but the ten of the disciples being, I guess, men, uh, they hear the words from the women and they consider it an idol tale. But Peter does something. Peter stands up, he runs, and all the accounts, although they're different, in every account, Peter is the one who's running to the tomb. And he stoops down, he looks in, and it's empty. It's orderly, though, because the, the linens are separate from each other. And then when he hears the story, he hears the story of resurrection, he is, the Bible says, he's amazed when he goes home. He goes home, does not tell anyone. The world needs to hear about resurrection. The world needs to experience resurrection. While the women told others, Peter went home. What does the empty tomb mean to you this morning? What does it mean for the stone that to roll away? What are we going to do with this good news? It is tempting to think the world knows the story, the greatest story ever told. But the world needs to hear the story. The world needs to experience the story, to know again and again that death has been swallowed up in victory. The gospel doesn't just tell the story, it shows us and it invites us to get involved. Once you hear the story, you can no longer sit on the sidelines. You have to share the story. We once read a story about a little girl who lived near the cemetery. And in order to get to the story, she had followed the path that led through the cemetery. But this little girl never seemed to have any sense of fear, even as she returned from the cemetery, returned to the cemetery at Docks. And one time, an old man asked her the question, aren't you afraid to go through the cemetery? And she said, oh no, I'm not afraid, for my home is just beyond. And this is the good news of Easter. It's because the stone has been rolled away, that it is not, we're not saved from death, but we're saved through Christ's death. We are saved through Christ's death in his resurrection. We know that as Christians, our home is just beyond. We are a resurrection people. The good news does not end in the death of Christ. It does not end in the silence of Holy Saturday. Easter is not the end of the story. It is the beginning of a new journey, the new life we have in Christ. Ten disciples stay back because it's here to be an iron tale. Peter got up and he ran and he experienced it, but he went home amazed. But the women, the women saw it. They looked in. They heard the message. They remembered and they shared it with other people. What are you going to do with the good news today? In the name of
Father, 